In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the Alaska Mail Day murders while making a breakfast quiche. In the winter of 1983, a small Alaska town was rocked when a man named Lewis pulled the trigger on his neighbor over morning coffee. Lewis went on to kill five other locals and badly injured two, but was his reasoning of saving the planet justified? Let's find out. So, as I'm sure you know, Alaska is super cold, especially in the winter. During those freezing cold months, the process of getting your mail is pretty interesting. Basically, there are these mail planes that come once a week, bringing letters and boxes, as well as groceries and other supplies. Mail planes actually operate year-round in super rural cities, but during the winter, these deliveries are crucial. And people in these small Alaska towns are super nice and friendly. So if they were to meet someone new on mail day, they'll often invite them over for a warm beverage and a snack. Mail day is like the only real day these people get to interact with other humans outside of those in their household. So I'm gonna start by making my crust. I have almond flour, garbanzo bean flour, flaxseed, butter, salt, water, and olive oil. In the winter of 1983, residents of McCarthy, Alaska were pretty much stranded with no running water, no telephones, and no electricity, aside from the standalone generators some people owned. So mail day for them was the only real thing they had to look forward to, to break up their cold and lonely days. On the night of Monday, February 28th, AKA one day before the coveted mail day in McCarthy, 39-year-old Lewis Hastings kicked back at his neighbor's house, which was in the town of Kennecott, about four miles away from McCarthy. Lewis's neighbor was a 29-year-old dude named Chris Richards. Chris and Lewis spent the evening drinking and playing board games. At the end of the night, Lewis went home, but the next morning at around 8.30, he showed back up at Chris's house. Chris was cooking his breakfast and thought Lewis was on his way to meet the mail plane. So he was like, hey, why don't you come in for a cup of coffee real quick? Lewis agreed. Now this part is a little muddy depending on the source you read. What you need to know is Chris was doing something in the kitchen, either continuing to cook his brekkie or reaching for his coffee mug. When Lewis, who came secretly strapped with two firearms that morning, aimed one at Chris and pulled the trigger. Chris then ducked down, but was hit again by a bullet. This one grazed past his head or neck. Once Chris realized what was going on, he lunged for Lewis to try and grab his weapon. The two men began to struggle, and the whole time, Chris was begging Lewis to stop firing bullets. Lewis replied with this, Look, you're already dead. If you'll just quit fighting, I'll make it easy for you. Chris was able to get his hands on a blade from the kitchen sink that he used to jab Lewis. Then Chris fled the scene wearing a t-shirt, pants, socks, and one slipper. But it was 10 degrees Fahrenheit and there was so much snow outside. So that posed a bit of a challenge. We're talking waist deep snow. Poor Chris was trying to escape his attacker and call for help, but he had to slowly make his way through super dense snow. So now I'm gonna press my crust into my quiche pan. Lewis went outside and continued to fire at Chris as he headed for the Kennecott Taurus Lodge. One bullet hit him in the arm. Chris was able to walk three quarters of a mile up a steep hill, which doesn't sound like a lot on the surface, but again, this was way steep snow in freezing cold temperatures, and Chris didn't even have a jacket. Not to mention the fact that he was trying to dodge bullets the whole time. At the top of the hill, Chris found a cabin and probably hoped someone would be in there to help him. But when he looked inside, the cabin seemed abandoned, other than a pair of boots, snowshoes, and a parka. Chris, who I'm hoping put on the parka and snowshoes, then journeyed a tenth of a mile further where he came upon another cabin. And this time, there were people inside. The cabin residents were newlyweds Tim and Amy Nash. When Chris came to their door, they probably took one look at him and knew he needed help. So the couple let Chris in their home and tended to his wounds as he told them all about what happened to him. Now I'm gonna pop my crust in the oven. Tim and Amy mentioned seeing Lewis walk past their house in the direction of McCarthy, and that's when it dawned on them. It was mail day, and Lewis was probably on his way to the runway with loaded weapons. 
Tim, Amy, and Chris discussed the possibilities of what might happen there and decided they better deck themselves out with firearms and head to the runway to protect their neighbors and try to warn some of them if possible. So the Nashes hopped in their snowmobile and hooked up a sled in the back for Chris. Together, the threesome traveled to the airstrip. I'm gonna heat up some oil. When the group got to the runway, they talked to a pilot named Gary who was cleaning his plane. Tim, Amy, and Chris gave Gary the rundown of what was going on, and that's when he told them he saw Lewis go towards the Heglin's house about 20 minutes earlier. Tim said he would go check on the Heglin's, but since Chris was in pretty rough shape, Gary decided to fly him to Glen Allen to get his wounds looked at. Gary told Chris he'd notify the authorities to get some state troopers out to help, as they feared the situation at the Heglins might be bad. But before Gary could even take off with Chris, Tim came running back to the airstrip to warn them of the gruesome scene. Tim said the house reeked of gun smoke. From what he could tell, it seemed like everyone in the house had been snuffed by Lewis. I'm gonna saute some onions. As Tim continued to scope out the scene, he walked to the kitchen and saw Lewis standing out on the back porch. Tim drew his weapon and fired at Lewis, but missed. Lewis sent a bullet right back at Tim and it hit him in the leg. Thankfully, Tim was able to escape and run back to the runway to warn the rest. He told Gary to still take Chris to Glen Allen and said he and his wife would stay back to warn the others as they arrived for their mail and packages. One of the worst things about this situation is how hard it was to communicate. There weren't any telephone poles or anything, so the best way to communicate was via radio. And the Heglins, who lived in McCarthy for over 15 years, acted as the communication hub for the town. Anytime someone in the McCarthy area needed to send an urgent message to someone, or just a faster message in comparison to mailing something, they'd go to the Heglins' house to use their radio. While Tim and Amy were standing at the runway waiting to warn residents of the situation as they showed up for mail day, Lewis was already in the area plotting to slay them. He followed a dog sled trail from the Heglins to the airstrip and made his way up this big pile of snow to use as a vantage point. He spotted the Nashes, who were about 750 feet away, and fired 10 bullets at them. Then, Lewis started to walk closer to the couple and fired four more bullets. After Tim and Amy were gone for good, Lewis dragged them across the snow, buried them, and waited for more locals to arrive. And not much later, two residents named Harley and Donna appeared. As they walked up, they saw a trail of red fluid and assumed it was from someone hunting animals. If only they knew. Harley and Donna thought it was kind of weird that a hunter would be going after animals on the runway, so they started to scope out the fluid trails, and when they got close to where Tim and Amy's bodies were, Lewis opened fire. Harley and Donna jumped on their snowmobile to try and get away as the bullets were flying. One hit Donna in the right arm, and another hit Harley in the right leg, which caused him to lose control and crash the snowmobile, which sent Harley and Donna flying. Donna tried to help get Harley back on, but Lewis was getting closer and closer. At that point, Harley couldn't move, so he told Donna to save herself. So Donna ran straight for the Heglins, not knowing what the scene was like there. So now I'm gonna add my mushrooms. I'm also gonna add my seasonings, which is onion powder, turmeric, nutritional yeast, and salt. She went up to the door and saw that it had been kicked in, so that's when she decided to hide in the greenhouse. As Donna was huddled down and shivering, she heard a voice call out, one not dead, one not dead. It was Lewis. Donna tried her best to stay silent, but as his footsteps approached, she thought for certain that was the end. But all of a sudden, Lewis turned around, got on the Nash's snowmobile, and drove off. As Lewis began driving west, state troopers were circling overhead in a helicopter. Now I'm gonna add tofu and spinach. They landed the helicopter and were able to flag Lewis down so they could talk to him. 
Lewis told the troopers something like, my name is Chris Richards, and there's this dude named Lewis Hastings who has gone crazy and is running around town whacking residents. Now I'm gonna take my crust out of the oven. The officers already talked to Greg and knew the real Chris was already in Glen Allen. And since this dude matched the description of Lewis, they assumed it was him and put him in cuffs. The state troopers threw the handcuffed Lewis in the helicopter and searched through the town for victims. At the runway, they found Tim and Amy Nash, as well as Harley. Then they went to the Heglins' house where they discovered the corpses of Les and Flo Hegland and their neighbor, Maxine. I'm gonna put my quiche filling on my crust. Okay, I'm gonna top my quiche with some cheese and some tomatoes. The troopers also found Donna, who was still alive, but badly injured. Then they helped Donna to the helicopter and flew her to Glen Allen. But they put her in the same helicopter as Lewis, so she literally had to fly next to him. Thankfully, Donna and Chris both survived their injuries. In the end, Lewis snuffed six people, and the population of McCarthy was just 22, so he literally took out almost one third of the entire town. Lewis eventually confessed to being the marksman, and he was taken to trial for six counts of manslaughter and two counts of attempted manslaughter. He was found guilty on July 27, 1984, and received six 99-year terms, as well as two 20-year terms, in total, that's 634 years in prison. Lewis tried to appeal his sentencing, saying he was temporarily insane, but his appeal was dismissed. The most recent update on Lewis is that he's being held at Spring Creek Correctional Facility in Seward, Alaska. Now I'm gonna stick my quiche back in the oven. All right, well now that we know Lewis is behind bars and the people of McCarthy are safe, Let's travel back in time to see what may have caused Lewis to go on this crazy killing spree. Lewis was born in Kansas back in January of 1944. At the time, his dad was serving in World War II, but when he got back home and met his baby, Lewis, he didn't approve. Since then, Lewis was said to have suffered from mental and emotional abuse at the hands of his father. Lewis's mom and sister said he was a super shy kid. He was diagnosed with chronic depression, but did a good job dealing with it, or at least hiding it, because Lewis grew up to be a very kind and passionate person. Lewis had a knack for animals and the environment, so much so that he would do things like volunteer to clean wildlife after oil spills. Lewis went to college and then served in the Air Force a bit before taking a job as a computer programmer at Stanford University. His colleagues at Stanford said Lewis was very quiet and introverted, Apparently, he wasn't even that good at programming, but not all of his co-workers felt this way. A librarian at Stanford named Madeline took a liking to Lewis, and by June of 1979, they were married. Lewis and Madeline went to Kennecott for their honeymoon, where they fell in love with the calm wilderness vibes of Alaska. So they were like, should we quit our jobs and move to Alaska? And that's just what they did. Lewis and Madeline first moved to Anchorage. Lewis started a computer service business that he could do remotely. During the first two years of living there, Lewis and Madeline's marriage went downhill fast. Sometime during their marriage, the couple bought a cabin in Kennecott to escape the growing city of Anchorage. By 1983, Lewis's computer business had gone to shit, and he just started living in the Kennecott cabin while his wife stayed at their place in Anchorage. That same year, there was a big economy and population boom in Anchorage because of the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline that was being built. Lewis, the environmentalist, was not about this pipeline and was looking for any way he could destroy it. And that's when Lewis started planning something awful. He bought a bunch of firearms and over 2,000 rounds of ammo. He built a silencer for one of his pistols using beaver fur. And he made a list of the 200 most prominent political leaders in Alaska. Lewis later confessed to doing all of this as a part of his master plot to destroy the pipeline. The original plan was to show up at the runway for mail day and whack anyone who arrived. Once the plane landed, He'd hijack it and fly it to a pump station near the pipeline. If he had any victims from the runway, he said he was gonna just dump them in the ocean. 
At the pump station, Lewis planned to rig the plane to take off without him in it, hop in a fuel truck that he'd have to steal, and ram it into the pipeline while firing bullets at it. He thought this would damage the pipeline enough to not function, but hoped since it was super cold that the oil would congeal and not become a bad oil spill or anything. Lewis thought the fuel truck would catch fire after hitting the pipeline, taking his life and burning his body so no one could tell who it was. The goal was for people to think Lewis was snuffed with the other victims in McCarthy and never suspect him as the mastermind behind it all. It was later revealed by a psychiatrist that Lewis had some sort of personality disorder in addition to his depression. At the end of the day, Lewis was dealing with a personality disorder, mental illness, rough childhood, a broken marriage, and the guy had an extreme passion for the earth. So what do you guys think about this case? What part did you find the most shocking? You know what I find shocking? The fact that I was able to make this quiche while telling you this story. It looks pretty darn good too. That's all for now.